in your chain reference Bibles, much of this work is already done for you. Now, I don't believe that there are any chain reference Bibles in any version of the English Bible except the King James Version, and that's one of the reasons I like to get people started in that, because uh, they can become familiar with it, so the chain referencing will be valuable to them. So you have cross-reference Bibles, and you have chain reference Bibles. Then you have annotated Bibles, and uh, eventually most Bibles that get to be rather widely used will have annotations. Now, the problem with annotations is this, that the person who put in the notes usually is trying to sway you to his uh, particular beliefs. For instance, the Seventh-day Adventists, they take a regular King James Version and they annotate it to suit themselves. And the Catholics, for instance, annotate it to suit themselves, and so that it will <coughs> sort of channel the reader into the uh, particular way of belief. And so probably in all annotations there is some slight tendency to do this. But I find that the annotations in the Scofield Bible uh, tend more uh, to use a lot of scriptural background and tend to have less of, you might say, the, uh, the influencing type uh, uh, a commentary. And uh, so the reason I use the Scofield Bible is because it has all three of these uh, uh, study aids. It has chain referencing, cross-referencing, and annotations, and there just aren't very many Bibles that have those, and I believe that all of those uh, helps uh, are very valuable in getting you into the Word, and so I trust that helps to explain why I uh, dispense that particular Bible. I don't uh, obviously uh, sell them to make a profit on them. I sell them exactly the same price I buy them which, as I say, is 60% of, uh, of the bookstore price. I, I make that little explanation every now and then uh, so that people understand why I seem to be commercializing the, the Bible study a little bit. Now let's turn to the 118th Psalm, Psalm 118. And we want to start by reading verse 22. Psalm 118, verse 22. The stone which the builders refused is become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Now, the 118th Psalm is one of 16 Psalms that are called Messianic Psalms. They are called messianic because in one or more of the verses in the psalm, there's a reference either to the first coming or the second coming of the Messiah, or that is, the first or second coming of Christ. Some messianic psalms are entirely about the coming of Christ. For instance, the second psalm or the 45th psalm. Those psalms are about Jesus Christ in their entirety. Others just will have a verse or two interspersed. But they all have one thing in common, and that is to say, the New Testament tells us that one or more of the verses is about Christ. In the particular psalm we just read from, and in that verse, that verse is referred to five times in the New Testament. And each time in the New Testament we're told that, it, that the stone is Christ. Uh, Jesus Christ refers to it, in, uh, to this verse, identifying himself in uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, in sermons, in Peter's sermon in Acts chapter 4, he refers to it and ascribes it to Christ. And then in Peter's first epistle, he again ascribes it to Christ. So in those five New Testament books, you have a quotation from this psalm, and that establishes it as a messianic psalm. Now, many of the other psalms, other than these 16 of which I'm, I speak, uh, have reference to Christ, but it's not specifically documented in the New Testament as a reference to Christ. So only those uh, psalms are called Messianic, uh, which uh, are documented in the New Testament. That is to say, they'll be quoted from in the New Testament, and the New Testament will tell you 
that the psalm is speaking of Jesus Christ. Now, you'll see that in reference to this one because, as we said, five times in the New Testament, we're told that this particular stone is Jesus Christ. Now, just by way of information, uh, this uh, 118th psalm has some other interesting facets. Uh, it comes in between the shortest chapter in the Bible and the longest chapter in the Bible. The shortest chapter being the 117th Psalm and the longest chapter being the 119th Psalm. Then another uh, interesting peculiarity about the, uh, the 118th Psalm is because it begins the second half of the Bible, if you're counting chapters. There are 1,189 chapters uh, in, the, uh, in the Bible. And, uh, the 117th Psalm is not only the shortest Psalm, but it's the middle chapter in the Bible. Uh, I guess you might not have learned that in Sunday school. Now, uh, if you were to count the chapters and find out I'm wrong, it's not because I'm poor on mathematics, it's just because I took what somebody else said. I didn't count them myself. Uh, so uh, the 117th Psalm, and uh, as far as uh, I've uh, come to believe, is the, the middle chapter in the Bible. And so the 118th Psalm then would start the second half, wouldn't it? 594 chapters before you get to it, and then 594 more after you get uh, to it. So that's just a little uh, extra sideline. But what we want to do is to take now that we've taken a scripture from the uh, Psalms, we want to uh, take some from the prophets. But let's just look at this verse a moment. The stone which the builders refuse, is become the head of the corner. Now, what he's saying is somebody wanted to build a building. And uh, there was a stone that should have been the very cornerstone or the foundation stone. And the builders said, no, we don't want to use that one. And uh, they, they rejected it. But that stone is going to be the corner of the building that's going to be built. Now, that's the, uh, uh, that's the thought or the, the message here. Now let's turn over to Isaiah chapter 8, and we'll uh, read about um, Jesus Christ, the stone, from the prophets. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 14, And he shall be for a sanctuary, but for a stone of stumbling, and for a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel, for a snare uh, for a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Now, we also know that this stone is speaking of Jesus Christ, and it says the nation of Israel is going to stumble on, the, on a stone. We'll see that it's quoted from. Uh, this verse is quoted in the New Testament. Then uh, the next passage we want to look at for a moment is Isaiah chapter 28. And we'll see again the stone. Isaiah 28, 16, Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, that means a tested stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believes shall not make haste. In other words, he that believes on this stone shall not have made a hasty or an imprudent decision. Now, we're going to look in a moment to the book of 1 Peter, and he's going to take all three of these passages that we just read, the one from the 118th Psalm and the two from Isaiah, and he's going to tie them together and apply them to Christ and to you. He's going to put you right in the center stage of, uh, of this matter of Christ the stone. But uh, before we do that, we want to look at one other Old Testament passage because Christ is going to refer to this when we get to New Testament, and we want to have these four scriptures. Now, these are the four predominant scriptures that clearly uh, refer to Jesus Christ, the stone, or that is to say they're the four scriptures that are documented in the New Testament as, uh, as describing him as a stone. There are many other scriptures, some of which we'll look at later, uh, which also refer in a more subtle manner or a more hidden manner. But our fourth scripture is in the prophet of Daniel. Daniel chapter 2. 
comes right after Ezekiel. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel. Chapter 2. Now let me give you a little background here. You will recall that Daniel was a captive in, uh, in Babylonia. And the king of Babylonia, who at that time was the emperor of all the civilized world, was a man by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar had a, a, a dream, and he couldn't remember the dream. And, but he knew that it was a very striking dream. So he called all of his uh, wise people together, and he says, You tell me what this dream is about, and if you don't, I'll chop your head off. And they couldn't. They didn't know what the dream was all about. They said, Look, you're asking us a rugged thing here. I'll tell you what you do. You tell us the dream, and we'll tell you the interpretation. And he says, uh-uh-uh-uh-uh, says, uh, yeah, I know what's in your heart. says, I'll tell you the dream and you'll make up an interpretation. And I won't know the difference. says, if you're so smart, you can give the interpretation. You give me the dream first. Well, uh, Daniel was among the wise men. So uh, he prayed to the Lord about this thing. The Lord said he would uh, help him to interpret it. And so he w uh, Daniel was taken before Nebuchadnezzar. And he told him that he could tell him the dream and also tell him the interpretation of it. And so here in the second chapter, Daniel, beginning with the verse uh, 31 of chapter 2, Daniel is going to tell the king the dream. He says, Thou, O king, saw and behold a great image. The, this great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form of it was terrible. This Im image's head was of fine gold, its breasts and its arms of silver, its belly and its thighs of brass, its legs of iron, its feet of uh, part of iron and part of clay, and thou saw until the stone, till a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image on his feet that were of iron and clay, and broke them to pieces. Then were the iron and the clay and the brass and the silver and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them, and the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Well, now, uh, Daniel, then, that's, he's given the dream there, then he in, interprets the dream. And if we were to read the interpretation, here's what we would find. We would find that the gold head stands for the empire of Nebuchadnezzar, and then the uh, arms, the silver shoulders and arms stand for the empire of the Medio Persians, and then the brass stands for the Greek empire, and then the uh, legs and feet stand for the Roman empire, the legs stand for the Roman empire, and then the, the feet, part of clay and part of iron, stand for the kingdom of the Antichrist, which is still to come. You see, there has been no worldwide ruler uh, since uh, the Caesars, and there's been no worldwide kingdom since Rome. But the Bible predicts that there will be one. And this image is an image of all five. That is, the four that began with Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom and ended with the Roman Empire, and then the fifth one, uh, which uh, it, it will be at the end time, and the fifth one is going to have its uh, feet or is smashed by a great stone, and then we're told this stone is going to become a great mountain that will fill the whole earth. Well, you don't have to learn much about Bible uh, figurative language to know that a mountain is a great kingdom. And so uh, they're speaking of the kingdom of the Messiah. And he here is the smiting stone. And this speaks of when he will come at the battle of Armageddon and destroy that worldwide kingdom which will be in the end time. You see what what God is doing, he's picturing man in this. This was like the statue of a man. And uh, the goal stands for the fact that he was created in God's image. But there's one problem. Silver stands for redemption. He needs to be redeemed. Brass stands for judgment. He has to be judged. And uh, the fact that he has iron, and iron stands for strength, and clay stands for uh, the parish perishability of man. Man is but clay. He's referred to many times in the Bible. And the fact that he has is he tries to walk on feet that are partly 
strong and partly crumble, he really doesn't know how to walk. This is the fulfillment of what the prophet Jeremiah said. He said, O Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. And this is what man wants to do. He wants to be his own boss. This is how Satan entered into the human race to start with and, and, and draw, drew them away from their God because man wants to run his own destiny. That's the reason you can't mention the name of Jesus Christ in the United Nations. Uh, he's not, uh, as a matter of fact, if you were uh, taking a, a letter of instruction or you were taking a course of instruction on how to be a proper employee, United States employee of the United Nations, you would be told that you're never to mention in anywhere, uh, when you're in the hearing of any other uh, members of any other country, never are you to mention the name of Jesus Christ because it will be offensive to the other people. Man uh, does not want in any of his peace organizations, he does not want the Prince of Peace to have any part of it. And uh, uh, it's uh, man wants to run his own show. That's his big problem, always has been his problem. And this is how God sees man as having been created in the image of God uh, gold stands uh, for uh, the uh, manifestation of deity, and man manifests God as he was originally created. And that's what you see here in, uh, in this image. But he can't walk. I mean, he can't direct his own steps. And because he tries to, one day his walk is going to come to an end, so to speak. So last week we spoke of the smitten walk from which came the water of life, remember. Well, the smitten walk of last week's lesson is going to become the smiting stone of this week's lesson. He was the smitten rock on Calvary's cross. He's the smiting stone when he comes back in power to reign. And he's, he, so to speak, smites man's whole image uh, on the feet so that he is not permitted to walk anymore. Uh, in, in other words, he doesn't control his own destiny anymore, or, or has no ability to even attempt to do so. And so uh, this speaks of the time when the kingdom will come, and uh, Jesus is going to refer to it uh, now. Uh, and I told you uh, this stone is referred to by Christ in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And the reason we're going to go to the Luke account is because it's more condensed and will serve our purposes. So let's all turn now to Luke chapter 20. And Jesus is talking here, we're told, in verse 17 of Luke 20. And he beheld them and said, now he's going to say this to the religious leaders of his day. <clears throat> what is this then that is written? The stone which the builders rejected, the same is become the head of the corner. Now he's quoting from the 118th Psalm. Remember, I told you that that verse was quoted uh, reproduced in the New Testament five times. This is one of those five times. In uh, Luke chapter 20, verse 17, the stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner. Now watch this, verse 18, whosoever shall fall upon that stone shall be broken. Now that's a reference, not a direct quote, but that's a reference to the, uh, to the Isaiah account, the one in Isaiah chapter 8 that spoke of the stone of stumbling or the rock of offense. But now notice the rest of this verse. But on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. Now, the, uh, the first part of that 18th verse refers to his first coming. The second part refers to his second coming. In verse 18, whosoever shall fall upon the stone shall be broken. Well, Israel stumbled on the stone. They, their foundation stone came. You see, both Isaiah and Zechariah told them that their, uh, their Messiah would come and it would be upon him that they should build, so to speak. And uh, they stumbled over their uh, foundation stone. And uh, he says that uh, whoever stumbles or falls, stumbles and falls on that stone, shall be broken. Well, that's what happened to Israel as a nation. They were broken completely 
uh, by the Roman Empire some years after Christ rose from the dead. But then it says, but on whosoever it shall fall. And here Christ is referring to that prophecy in Daniel. So he's, he's taking three of those Old Testament passages and tying them together right here in this passage and identifying himself as that stumbling stone. Now, he didn't come right out and says, I am that stone. But he made it very clear. And so that you wouldn't misunderstand, Peter uh, clears it up. And that he does that in a, uh, in a sermon in Acts chapter 4. And this sermon was spoken to the uh, Jewish leaders. You see, uh, Peter had uh, preached two sermons, one's to be found in the second chapter and one's to be found in the third chapter. And that was to the people, uh, the, uh, the uh, devout Jews who were gathered in Jerusalem from all the parts of the earth at that particular time. And uh, many of them were converted. But then he spoke directly to the, to the top leaders. See, um, in uh, chapter 4, verse 5 of Acts, and it came to pass on the morrow that their rulers and elders and scribes and Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and as many as were of the kindred of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them uh, in the midst, they asked, By what power or by what name have you done this? And Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to this impotent man, they just uh, raised up an impotent man, by what means he is made well, be it known unto you, that is, you leaders of Israel, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised up from the dead, even by him does this man stand here before you hold. Now watch, verse 11. This is the stone which was set at naught by you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Now, I want you to know that he said that to Jewish leaders. Now, uh, all of the sermons that were preached after Christ rose from the dead were preached only to Jews for many, many months. And uh, uh, God started was to the, to the Jew first. And here he's giving the Jewish leaders who brought about the crucifixion of Christ, he's giving them the opportunity. And he's saying, Look, you remember when Jesus was here just before you crucified him, he said this about, he quoted from the 18th Psalm and said this about uh, the, uh, the, uh, the stone the, that, that you said it not and it would become the head of the corner. Well, I want you to make it very clear. Jesus Christ is that stone. Now, of course, uh, this is... Uh, one of those five times we told you that that psalm was quoted in the New Testament. And this, of course, is what establishes it as a messianic psalm. Because in the New Testament, it's declared very clearly to be about Jesus Christ. Now, anybody should be able to see that, shouldn't they? That, uh, that Peter is saying that that stone in Psalm 18 that Jesus talked about is, G is, is Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, and who God raised up. There could be no other. And at the same time, you see, since he's uh, explaining to them what Jesus meant, when Jesus talked to them just a few days before that, now it had just been a little while before that when Jesus had, uh, had talked to them, before he was crucified, it was only two, three, uh, just two days, uh, before, or three days at the most, before his crucifixion when he gave that account that we read in Luke. And uh, he's, uh, Peter is applying that for them. Now, the fact that Jesus referred to three of those Old Testament instances, he referred, referred to the one in uh, Psalm 118, he referred to the one in Isaiah 8, and he referred to the one in Daniel chapter 2, you see. And so when Peter documented him as one stone, he documented him as all three stones, so to speak. And this is how you uh, this is how you prove Bible typology. You search until you find a scripture that makes it quite clear, and then you go back and apply it everywhere it's applicable, or where it can be applied. Now, 
Paul, when he started preaching, he took this theme of Jesus Christ being the cornerstone on which something was be built. And uh, he stressed it, for instance, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11, uh, when he said, And other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And then in uh, Ephesians chapter 2, he says, building the church is like building a temple. And Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. And then each Christian that comes along is a stone in that temple. That's a, an explanation that Paul made in Ephesians chapter 2. Now, Peter, in Peter, uh, 1 Peter uh, chapter 2, he's going to tie three of those scriptures together. Not the Daniel scripture, but he's going to tie the 118th Psalm in with Isaiah chapter 8. In Isaiah chapter 28, and he's going to let us know that all of these are about Christ and that not only are they about Christ, but they have something to do with each of us. And so let's start reading in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisy and envies and all envies and all the evil speakings, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. If so be, you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. In other words, if you've been saved, now you need to grow. You've been born again, you need to grow. And you grow by the word. Now God has something in mind for those who want to grow. Verse 4, To whom coming as a living stone, this is talking about Jesus, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious, Ye also, speaking of Christians, as lively stones, which is another way of saying living stones. In the original, it would be the same as the living of verse 4. Ye also, as living stones, are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Now, Peter's making the same analogy that Paul makes back in Ephesians chapter 2. He's saying it's as though God wanted a temple. Uh, on this earth in which to be worshipped. And he's making his temple out of saved people. Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. And then he's fitting a stone here and there all throughout until he has a complete temple. And each one of you are a stone in that temple. You see, by definition, a temple is a place from which God shows forth his glory. The word glory is excellence on display. So a temple is that place from which God displays his excellence. And that's why uh, Paul wants to get our ear when he says, Know ye not that your bodies are the temple of God, and therefore they're holy. The, and the Spirit of God dwells in you individually and corporately. Now he's going to go on, and he's going to talk about... Uh, He's going to take these three scriptures from the Old Testament and he's going to tie them together. And he uh, does that beginning with verse 6. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture. Now when in the New Testament you read the word scripture, it's referring to the Old Testament. Wherefore it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Now here he's quoting from Isaiah 28, now verse 7, Unto you, therefore, who believe, he is precious. But unto them who are disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. Now that's the quote from Psalm 118, isn't it? And then verse 8, And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Now that's the quote from Isaiah chapter 8. Even to them who stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereto it also, they were appointed. So what Peter's doing, he's taking these old three Old Testament scriptures, the first three we found in the Old Testament, and he's saying those all refer to Christ. And they have to do with the fact, he's called, the reason he's called this cornerstone is because he's building a temple. Now, before we go back to the Old Testament, we'll go to Ephesians chapter 2 and see uh, Paul's commentary on that. But don't go now because I, I got some more I want you to see in... in First Peter. It's just a little sideline, but notice in First Peter chapter one, verse twenty-three, 
It's being born again by the word of God. See, and being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God. 1 Peter 1.23, being born again by the word of God. 1 Peter 2.2, 2, grow by the word of God. And 1 Peter 2.8, stumble at the word of God. See, the ones who are born of the word of God grow by the word of God. And those who will not be born by the word of God, then they stumble at the word of God. And that's ever been the situation. And it's still the situation today. And that's why the Israelites stumbled because they wouldn't accept Jesus Christ uh, as their Savior. Now, I'd like to tell a little story about this section here in uh, 1 Peter chapter 2. Many of you know that I was saved through the ministry of the Christian Businessmen's Committee of Lakeland. And uh, uh, a couple of three years after I was saved, there was a group of four of us that used to go every time we could take a week off. We'd go somewhere throughout the southeast in Jim Welch's plane and we'd, uh, we'd just try to establish a CDMC there. Uh, and some of those uh, were established and still are going. We'd, we'd all jump in his, in his plane and uh, we would uh, correspond with some Christians over there. And uh, let's see, I'll just name some of the cities. Uh, it was quite an extensive operation. Uh, in Louisiana, we went to Lafayette, New Orleans, and Alabama. We were in Mobile and Montgomery and Georgia. Uh, we were in Columbus and Albany and uh, Macon and Fort Valley and Augusta and Savannah. Uh, in uh, Florida, we were in Daytona and Jacksonville and, and several other places. Well, I, I just wanted to get to the picture. And what we'd do, you see, uh, we'd be flying in Jim's plane and he'd call in ahead and ask the uh, operator there on the airport to, to get us a taxi. And then the taxi would, would uh, take us into the hotel where we were going to have a meeting. See, we would have contacted some Christians in that city and they would have arranged a banquet-like affair. And uh, where we get uh, Christian men and those that weren't Christian, we'd come and give our testimonies. Now, three of us, were, uh, see, the fellow that led Jim to the Lord would be with us, and and then he led me to the Lord, and we were sort of, the other one was kind of the moderator, and then we were father, son, and grandson, so to speak, uh, uh, spiritually. And we give our testimony that way, and it was very effective. And uh, we saw a lot of people come to Christ that way. But I remember when we were doing that, one time we flew up to Jacksonville, and uh, we landed n not in the main uh, airport there, but uh, in uh, a field called Cecil Field. And uh, Jim called in about uh, 10 uh, uh, miles out and uh, asked the operator to please uh, uh, have a taxi cab because we needed uh, a cab to carry us in to the Robert Meyer Hotel where uh, the, uh, the banquet was going to be held that night. Now, this is quite a number of years ago. And uh, so we all got in the taxi cab and there was the fellow's picture and name up in the front of the taxi cab. I don't know if you've noticed that or not, but sometimes they have that. And his name was Livingston, uh, L-I-V-I-N-G-S-T-O-N-E. And uh, so we got in the car, and I happened to be sitting in the front seat with him, and the other three were sitting in the back. And uh, I asked him if he were any kin to David Livingston. And uh, he knew who David Livingston was, and he says, well, I don't know. I suppose somewhere way back in the back, he, uh, somewhere, he says, he was from England, and my ancestors came from England, but I don't know what kin it would be. And I says, well, it'll be interesting when you see him. And he kind of looked at me, you know, a little bit startled, and, and I says, uh, don't you plan to see him? And uh, he says, well, I think he's dead. <laughs> and uh, I said, well, but, you know, Robert Livingston was a Christian, and he's in heaven now. And if you're going to heaven, well, you'll see him. And he says, well, he says, I guess that's so. I said, uh, you know, do you know how your name came about? Do you know how you got your name? And uh, he says, no, I don't know how I got my name. And I said, well, I'll tell you. He, I said, there was a time when only the nobility in England were uh, permitted to have last names. And uh, uh, the uh, serfs or the lower people, the common people, could only have first names. And they had to be known as uh, the son of so forth or something. You had to identify them some way, other way. They weren't permitted to have last names. And so when uh, uh, the common people uh, got their rights and so forth in the Magna Carta and then after that, uh, they were permitted to have last names. And so everybody was madly looking around for a last name. And most of the Christian people wanted to take last names that came from the Bible. 
And uh, so one Christian man decided that it would be a wonderful thing, since he was a Christian and he was a living stone in the house of God, as described here in 1 Peter. Well, he took for himself the last name of Livingstone. That's where David Livingston got his last name, and that's where you got your last name. So I know somewhere the first man that ever had your last name was a Christian, or he would have never picked that name. And as a matter of fact, he, it wasn't only that he was a Christian, but he was a dedicated Christian. He was a Christian that knew the Word, knew the Bible. And I expect he's going to be a wheel up in heaven uh, because uh, uh, he has those earmarks. And David Livingston is too. And you're going to be, uh, uh, you're going to be quite uh, somebody up there to have such uh, prominent uh, uh, friends and relatives uh, up there in the hereafter. I said, now, if you had died last night, where would you be now? And he says, if there's a hell, I'd be burning in hell. Now, that's just what he said. And uh, I says, well, why do you say that? And he says, well, he says, I know one thing. There's nobody in, no place in heaven for the likes of me. And uh, so I says, well, would you like to go to heaven? And he says, well, I guess anybody would. And uh, do you know how if you really wanted? And he says, no, I can't say I did. And uh, I thought I'd talked enough. And so uh, Jim Welch was sitting in the back, and I said, well, now, back in the back seat is the fellow that told me how to get to heaven. He's the city judge. At that time, Jim Welch was the, was the city judge of Lakeland. And I said, he's the city judge of the city of Lakeland. And he's a pretty smart fellow, and he can tell you all about uh, being judged and so forth, and he can tell you how you can get to heaven without being judged. And uh, that's pretty good, isn't it? And by this time, this guy was really interested. You know, I'd been able to make a a tie-in there with his name and so forth. And uh, so Jim started just giving the, uh, the simple gospel plan. And just about the time uh, we, uh, 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 we got the presentation, the gospel before him, he pulled up in front of the Robert Meyer Hotel. There was this uh, line of taxis. And he was about third in line, you see. And the doorman was madly opening the door and ushering people out, you know. And uh, then each other taxi would pull up and there was a line of taxis uh, coming from the airport and various places bringing people in. And so he was in that line. Well, we got right here in front of the door. It was our time. Just as uh, this man said he would like to know how to get to heaven. And the doorman from the Robert Meyer, he pulled open the, the door, you know, to let us out. And uh, so uh, Ken Harris, another fellow there, he says, you'll have to hold things. We're not ready to get out yet. And he closed the door back. And then... Jim Welch told that taxi driver to bow his head. And he did, right there in front of the Robert Meyer Hotel with the, with the taxi cab back of him, honking his horn to beat the band, and the, the uh, uh, doorman pulling his hair like this, you know. And uh, there we were all in that car praying, and this guy uh, asked Christ to come into his heart and to save his soul uh, right there. And uh, when he asked, when he prayed, he was oblivious. He was entirely oblivious of everything that was going on. He wasn't paying a bit of attention. One of us had read the uh, the meter at that time and uh, found out that it was well, those were better days than now. It was about four dollars or something like that. And so he pulled out a five dollar bill and says, "Here, take it and go." Well, I hope that uh, you'll be able to see Mr. Livingston in heaven one day. And he'll tell you his version of that story. But I was sitting there right beside him the whole time, so I'm pretty well familiar with what went on. But uh, see, it pays to, uh, to know what the Bible's all about. But uh, that's my, uh, my story about this, uh, this story in the, uh, in the book of First Peter. Now, before we go back to the Old Testament a moment, I want us to look at Ephesians chapter 2, and we'll get another thought on this, uh, this matter of the foundation. In case you want somebody else to tell you that story, I just thought of the fourth fellow it was in. It was J.C. Rogers. It was J.C. Rogers, who's a lawyer in Lakeland. It was uh, Ken Harris, who's a realtor in Lakeland. It was Jim Welch, who's a lawyer in Lakeland. It was, it was me, the four of us, were in that car. That's about one of the most interesting uh, episodes that, that, that happened to us. In... Uh, Ephesians chapter 2, 
Verse 19. Now, there, uh, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. Here's, now, this is not a direct quote, and I didn't count it among the five. Uh, see, uh, I counted Matthew, Mark, Luke, Acts, and 1 Peter. So if you wanted to count this one, that would be six references. Verse 21, In whom all the building, fitly framed together, grows unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are built together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. See, this carries out the theme of what he's talking about. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ is built upon the foundation of the cornerstone, and we are building blocks in that temple. See that? It's a beautiful application, and it has its roots back there in the Old Testament. Now, you remember last week, uh, we turned to a scripture in Luke chapter 24 where Jesus, after his resurrection, said that uh, it said he opened up the scriptures concerning himself in Moses and the prophets and the Psalms. He told us that he was in each of those three places. Now, we found him as the stone in the Psalms, haven't we? And we found him in the prophets, but we haven't looked in the Pentateuch. Now, here's a good key for Bible interpretation. Every figurative word in the Bible is explained somewhere else in the Bible, and usually it has its root in the Pentateuch. Usually it has its root in the Pentateuch. But many times, when the figurative word is used in the Pentateuch, it won't be recognizable and it takes the rest of the scriptures to unfold it. In other words, it's in concealed form. Now, I'm going to take you to several places in the Pentateuch, that is the first five books in the Bible, where Jesus Christ is the stone, but you'd never know it unless you knew a lot about the rest of the scriptures. You'd never see him as the stone. In Genesis chapter 49, in this chapter, Jacob is about to die, and he calls each of his twelve sons toward, uh, to him, and he blesses each one of them. He gives each one of them a blessing. And Joseph, you'll remember, is the eleventh of his twelve sons. And he begins the blessing upon Joseph in, in verse 22, having already blessed the, uh, the ten previous ones, or the ten older brothers. Now, uh, he makes a prophetic utterance. For instance, when he talked about uh, Judah in verse 10, he said, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. Now, this is a reference to the fact that when Jesus Christ would be born, see, the scepter is that the badge of rulership, uh, that when the king comes, that he'll be descended from Judah. And, of course, the New Testament makes it clear that Jesus Christ is the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's descended from Judah. I just want to give you that as an example. Now, the prophecy concerning Joseph is begins in verse 22. Joseph is a fruitful bough or a fruitful branch. Now, if you've been to many of my Bible studies, you'll know that the branch is one of the names of the Lord Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. Maybe someday we'll do a Bible study on that. Jesus Christ the branch. The, uh, from the 35th chapter of Genesis on through the rest of the book of Genesis, you have the story of Joseph. Joseph is the principal character in those last 16 chapters of Genesis. And he is a type of Christ in Christ's perfections. You won't see anything wrong said about Joseph because he pictures Christ in, the, in his perfections. And you have to have that background to realize that when he says Joseph is a fruitful brow, he's really talking about Joseph as he typifies Christ. He's a fruitful bough. By a well, that means the well of salvation. With joy shall ye draw waters from the wells of salvation. Isaiah says. That's Isaiah 12, 3. Verse 23. Now this is speaking about his, his uh, crucifixion. The archers have sorely grieved him and shot at him and hated him. 
by the archers, they mean the people that have the power from a human standpoint. This is speaking about when he was crucified. But his bow abode in strength, and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty the, uh, God of Jacob. From there is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. Well, this shepherd, the stone of Israel, is the Messiah. And it's referring to Joseph and his typology. Now, I told you uh, Christ as the stone in the Pentateuch would be hidden, and you'd never know it except if you tied it in with other scriptures. But he's the stone here. Now, let's look at um, Exodus chapter 20. <clears throat> And this, to me, this is an extremely interesting portion. Exodus chapter 20, verse 25. Exodus 20, 25. And if thou wilt make me an altar of stone, thou shalt not build it of hewn stone, for if thou lift up thy tool upon it, thou hast polluted it. Now, you could find other references. Every time it ref uh, the Bible refers to a stone being used as an altar, it's carefully careful to advise that that stone is not to be hewn. It's not to be shaped in any way by man. And uh, if you want to read some more reference to that, you'll find uh, this referred to, uh, for instance, in Deuteronomy uh, 27, 5 and 6, and then in Joshua chapter 8, when Joshua builds an an altar of stone. He's, he's very careful to instruct them that the stone is not to be in any way touched with a tool. Now this is a picture that you must not add anything to what Christ has done as your burnt offering. See, this, this altar was for the offering of burnt offerings, you'll see if you, if you uh, carry this forward, and where he offered himself up to God. Nothing is to be added to his crucifixion. It, the New Testament verse would be for by grace are you saved through faith, in that not of yourself. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. See, if you tried to m make this altar of stone any more acceptable, you'd only be polluting it. So uh, it's not to be uh, worked on by man's hands. And, of course, that's what most of our religious systems are. They're hewn stones. They, they, they picture a Christ that's not like the real Christ. They've added all the trappings, their own. They've hewn the stone to make it uh, look like they want it to look, so to speak. Now, you may not see this, and uh, I'm not really trying to explain it. I just want to assure you it's there, and you can uh, go to the Spirit yourself, and he will instruct you on these things. Because these hidden truths that you'll find in the Bible are very, very precious when the Holy Spirit himself lets you know for sure that that's what it's talking about. And I really can't do that. In other words, I can point it out, but you're never going to know that this stone that, that must not be touched with man's tools is Jesus Christ. You'll never really know that until the Spirit teaches it to you from somewhere else in the Bible. And then it will be your own, not because I said it, you see. Okay, the next one would be Exodus Chapter 31, verse 18. And he gave unto Moses, when he had made an end of communing with him, uh, with, uh, communing with him on Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony, tables of stone, written with the finger of God. Now, chapter 32, verse 15. And Moses turned and went down from the mount, and the two tables of the testimony were in his hand. The tables were written on both sides, and on one side and on the other side they were written. And the tables were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God graven upon the tables. Now, let me give you uh, the background of this. God had called Moses up into the, un, to the mountains, in the clouds of the mountains, and had given him the Ten Commandments orally. And, and uh, Moses had brought these Ten Commandments. You'll find this story in the 19th chapter of Exodus. And he brought these uh, uh, Ten Commandments back down uh, to the children of Israel and said, this is God's law. And they said, all that God says we will do. 
That is, they accepted the law. And so uh, then uh, God asked Moses to come back up in the mountain uh, so that they could have it permanently. And what happened is God shaped the stones himself. And he wrote upon those stones with his finger, it said. See, uh, uh, in, in this 3118, the last phrase, tables of stone written with the finger of God. This word tables means like a tablet. And God wrote the Ten Commandments on those two stones. On one stone he wrote those commandments which had to do with man's relationship to God. On the other one, uh, the commandments that had to do with man's relationship to man. Well, you remember the story. When Moses brought these two stone tablets that were made by God and written on by God, when he brought them down to the children of Israel, they were already breaking the first commandment. Thou shalt have no other God before me. And they had made themselves an idol uh, because they were planning to go back to Israel, I mean Egypt, and they wanted to make an idol that would be acceptable to Egypt. And when Moses saw them worshiping that idol, what did he do? He took those two tablets of stone and smashed them, didn't he? Okay, then what happened? God forgave them their, uh, their sin. And look in verse, chapter 34. And this is just after the cleft in the rock episode we had last week, which was in chapter 33. Exodus 34, verse 1. And the Lord said unto Moses, Hew thee two tables of stone like unto the first. Now this is strange, because you see, God made the first two tablets, and he wrote upon them. This time he's taking, telling Moses to make the two tablets. And the Lord said unto Moses, Hew thee two tablets tables of stone, like unto the first, and I will write upon these tables the words that were in the first tables, which thou didst break. And be ready in the morning, and come up in the morning unto Mount Sinai, and present thyself there to me in the top of the mountain, and no man shall come up with thee, neither uh, let any man uh, be seen throughout all the mount, neither let the flocks nor herds feed before that mount. And he hewed, that is, uh, Moses did, hewed two tables of stone, like unto the first, and Moses rose up early in the morning and went up unto the Mount Sinai, and the Lord had commanded him, and took in his hand the two tables of stone. See, Moses, the first two God gave them to Moses written on. These two, Moses hewed out himself and took them to the top of the mountain, and then God wrote on them. Now, if you want a resume of this, Mo Moses reiterated this whole uh, situation to the second generation of Israelites in the book of Deuteronomy. You can read the ninth and tenth chapters of Deuteronomy and it'll put it all together for you in a condensed form, you might say. And you can see, because uh, Moses was simply telling the next generation what had happened in those, two, uh, in those two chapters in Deuteronomy. And it'll make it quite clear to you just exactly what happened. Now, as soon as God wrote on that second two stones, Moses took them and put them in the Ark of the Covenant, which was kept in the tabernacle. Now, everything in the tabernacle speaks of Christ in some way. Now, the first two stones were never put in the tabernacle. They do not speak of Christ. But the second two stones do speak of Christ. They're Christ as the Word was written he was the Word of God. He is the Word of God. And God's laws were written on his heart. See, he fulfilled God's law in his life. You see, the first two sets of stones represent Adam. God formed the body of Adam. And then he wrote his laws on Adam's heart. And Adam knew right from wrong. But Adam did wrong. And Adam, so to speak, was broken by death. But when Christ came into the world, he was made by human agency, wasn't he? Jesus, I mean, God didn't fashion the body of Christ with his hand, so to speak, did he? No, as he did Adam's. He fashioned the body of Adam with his own hands and placed his laws in Adam's heart. But Jesus Christ came, was the seed of a woman. He came from human source, from the body of the Virgin Mary. And his, that 
it's those stones you see were not formed by the hands of God, but God still wrote his law on the heart of Christ. And it's those tablets of stone that were put in the Ark of the Covenant which represented the presence of God. Now, I've given you a very, very important and precious truth uh, in a very few words, and it's deserving of much more explanation than that. But you see, in order to cover the subject, we'd have to spend about 10 or 12 weeks on the tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant. We'd have to start in the 25th chapter of, of Exodus and go through the whole rest of the book of Exodus before we could really give a basis for the understanding of Jesus Christ, the Word of God, who is that second Adam. You know, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he's called the last Adam, the second man. He, uh, he, he, Adam typified him in a way. But you, there's a difference, too. There's a counter-distinction in comparing the two. So, the first tables of stone represented that human being that was formed by God, the laws of God written on his heart, but they were broken because man regarded something higher than he regarded God. But the second table of stone represented that one who would come, who would not break God's law. And that's why they were kept, to represent the very presence of God in the Ark of the Covenant. Now you can see, we have found here the stone, Jesus Christ the stone, in the Pentateuch, in three different instances. We found him there uh, as that stone of Israel. We found him there uh, as the unhewn uh, altar of burnt offering. And we found him as the stone upon which the laws of God were written. And But this is more subtle, you see. It, it, there's no place in the New Testament now where you could go, and it would tell you in so many words, that stone is Christ. Now, last week, we could go to the New Testament, and <clears throat> we found the rock in Exodus chapter 17, and then in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, that rock was Christ. Now, watch this. Most of the typology in the Pentateuch will not be that plain, just a few instances, so that you can tell that there is such typology in the Pentateuch. But usually, the typology in the Pentateuch will be way under the surface, and you've got to know God's Word. Now, let me tell you one thing else. Christians who make it their chief occupation to go tearing off in all parts of the country where thousands gather together in big Jesus congregations, you know, and big healing services and all of that, you know, like you had in Orlando and like you have here and there. Christians that make that their chief occupation will never, never have the blessing of this type of thing because God gives you these truths in little groups just among those who really want to know what the Bible is all about. And this type of truth is closed to the, to the Christian that makes it his position in point to go tearing off to all kind of big meetings places where they can see something spectacular. God gives you these opportunities to choose. He gives you what you really want. And sometimes he gives us the desires of our hearts and brings leanness unto our souls. You know where to find that in the Bible? <clears throat> That's uh, Psalm 106, verse 15, I think. Well, we went over a little while, didn't we? That's a big subject now, and we didn't cover it. We, uh, we didn't even find the headstone in Zechariah, did we? Uh, so we, uh, we had plenty of ammunition left, uh, but you can only cover so much in one hour. Let's pray. <laughs> Lord, we thank you for these glorious truths that we find in your word, and we pray that we will continue to seek out Jesus Christ as he's found in Moses and in the Psalms and in all the prophets. And might we apply our heart diligently to these things in Jesus' name. Amen.